construction and maintenance, we have that too. We got to take care of all these properties that, that we're operating. That we're, oh, it just says recording. Never mind. Forget. Um, business development. Again, uh, if you're a people person, you want to kind of be in sales. There's absolutely some of that too. We got to gain new clients from a, a fee management standpoint. And if none of that interests you and you just want to make money without doing much, it's a great passive investment. And we'll talk about that today. And I know from the other classes, by show of hands, and I'm sorry, I can't see everyone on Zoom, but for those that are here, how many certificate classes have you been to? One was required. Have you been to if one other than this? One, and if you've been to all, I think this is the third. Anyone been to the last two? Oh, four. Thank you. Anyone to been to all three so far prior to me? All right, so just a few. All right, good. So the nice thing is, hopefully there'll be some overlap. So I might, uh, I know Anthony was first with the principles of real estate. So I might go back. In fact, I stole Anthony's slide if you can't if you remember. Uh, I have a couple of his slides in here, not to go over in detail, but just to review. So it'll give you a second look at it if, if you haven't seen it before. Um, so bottom line with this conversation today and hopefully this certificate class uh, or, or process in general, it covers a lot of different interests, right? So um, probably some point of what we just went over is gonna, is gonna grab your attention and that's why you're here today. So that's the definition of asset and property management. That's what we're gonna be talking about today. And before I did that, it's always nice if you're gonna sit and listen to someone for as long as we are today, it might be nice to know who the heck you're talking to. So I'll start with the pictures because I'm more of a picture guy. That's my beautiful wife, Amy, and our three kids. And that was a little trip to uh, Hawaii this past summer. Um, what can I say? Background. I mean, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff today. And we're going to talk about achieving anything you want in life, not just in real estate. That's what's cool about today. We're going to talk about a lot of things, and I want you, especially at home, to commit to it. We're going to do some activities. I'm going to share some things. Forget the textbook stuff. If I were you, right, if I, back when I went here, as you can see, I graduated no one. If I'm in your shoes, I want someone to come up and tell me all the secrets of life. Give me what, if you walk away here with one thing and you do it, that's a success. So we're going to be talking about some textbook stuff, but more importantly, we're going to be talking about some life stuff. And you'll see when we get into some goals, I'm going to have you write down some goals and objectives. We're going to talk about not only do what you want, but why you want, right? I'm bringing this up now because that's my why, those three boys, right? And it's whatever drives you, you got to find the why. That's the key. So when I'm sitting up here talking about property management, and which isn't that sexy of a, of a job, really, right? I mean, we're, we're service, right? We, well, we went through all the different interests, but what drives the, what's the passion behind it, right? And it's going to be your why. And that goes for any goal or objective in life. We're going to talk about the day, today. I know, I think all of you guys have computers at home, uh, get a, a piece of paper and a pen ready for, for later on. But let me go through this real quick. Since we typed it out, I was born and raised in L.A., in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, I mentioned I am a, a class of 2001 undergrad. I majored in business and marketing. Right out of school, it's interesting how, how things just happen. Um, I, do you guys still do job fairs here? Yeah, cool. Um, at a job fair, I was walking around not knowing what the heck I wanted to do, and I see something about wine, like a sign you know, the different tables. I don't know if they still do that. And I remember thinking, right, because you're looking at what interests me, what grabs my attention. I remember thinking, well, I like drinking wine. I'll go talk to them. So I introduced myself to Ian e J. Gallo Winery, the folks that were there. And uh, it was Will Skinner was his name. He was an alumni as well of LMU. Now, it was probably the, the best um, coincidence, right, I could, I could have done to walk up to that table. Ian e J. Gallo Winery had a management development program. And... I was selected for it through an interview process, which was great. Uh, and bottom line, I bring this up because I think so much of my, my professional career, I owe to the training from the Gallo family, the Gallo winery. That management development program basically 
teaches you at a young age, you got to put in the work, et cetera, but they kind of move you into management uh, positions. So I was managing uh, 24 people at the age of 23. So you talk about being thrown to the wolves, right? You got to figure it out quick. And with their training, it, it really kind of set me up um, for success for the rest of my career. But I, I say that because think about that from internships. Don't think about necessarily the, the pay. Think about is someone going to be there to help you learn the training that you can get? Because if you could take that in any industry and apply it to other jobs that you might go, up, go after um, you know, when you graduate. From the Gala Winery, so to give you an idea, I went from uh, LA manager, they moved me to Las Vegas. Could you imagine that? Uh, I ran the state of Nevada for the winery, so I managed three distributorships now. And then after five years, I think I got a little bored with it. I jumped over to medical device sales. It was fun. I did it for, for the, the money, um, right? Because when you're young, you think it's all about money. Uh, I did that for five years. And then I jumped over to Moss & Company. Now, it was the management background, the training I got from Gallup, and the sales from Luminous, right? Kind of both of them were marketing and sales. So when I went over to Moss & Company, I joined that firm, this firm that I'm, I'm still with, as a business development guy, a sales guy. It was a company that's been around since 1960. At the time, they were 4,000, just under 4,000 apartments under management. And I come over as a salesperson and in year one, brought in zero business. Year one, I was like, oh, this is tough, right? But like anything, you gotta learn the product, et cetera. Um, long story short, long story longer, five years later, we were over 10,000 units. And today we have uh, almost 14,000 units under management apartments in greater Los Angeles. So Moss & Company is a, a regional uh, management company, uh, often referred to as a fee manager, which just means owners hire us for a fee to, to operate. So, and we also have a commercial division, which is you know, your office, your industrial, your retail. And we have about 2 million feet under management uh, with Moss as well. That gives you kind of an idea from when I graduated LMU and the career process uh, all the way to Moss & Company. Now, the nice thing, and this is important, everyone at home, when I was, let's see, just five years ago, no, seven, seven years ago, other than my home that I lived in, I didn't have any uh, property investments, real estate investments. So maybe you guys already do, already have investments, which is fantastic. So in other words, if you don't, I was just like you up to uh, seven years ago. I got into my first property in Hollywood and it, an eight unit property. And it's scary, right? When you're, when you're finally jumping in uh, to an investment property, that was the first property. And everyone around me said, as we're doing due diligence, walking through, right? Making sure everything's okay. Everyone around me that I knew said, don't do it. Don't do it. In other words, got to take some risks sometimes, right? People around you have your best interest at heart. There's no doubt. But there's something called fear. There's something that is called fear that holds us all back. If I didn't go with that purchase, and as you guys know, the market just, just takes off. If I didn't go with that purchase, I wouldn't have had the capital to continue investing. And today, uh, which we're going to get into some goal writing, uh, I'm an investor or own nine properties. So not necessarily I own them by myself, but I invest with our clients, uh, which is great. And I, I put it down there at the, at the bottom, uh, general partner of an office building, Westlake Village. So I don't know, maybe you guys at home, maybe you guys here are thinking, you, you hear people come up here and talk and you know, they've got this portfolio. I don't have a great portfolio, right? Most of my day job is, is Moss and Company Management. Um, but I remember being in being a student or even 10 years ago saying, I want this portfolio of real estate so I can have passive income, so I can you know, enjoy life. I can do what I want when I want to do it. I want financial freedom, right? But 10 years ago, I'm thinking, how the heck do I get there? 
that, right? And maybe that's going through your mind. So just understand, everybody goes through that. Question. How much money did you start your first investment? Very good. Great question. I had 200,000 to put in the deal. I needed five, half a million. The property cost 1.1 million. I, uh, there was eight units, believe it or not. So that gives you an idea of you know, what the market has done since. Um, I had to go around and borrow money to get the deal done. I had to ask friends and family. Guess who gave me money? I think it was my parents. I said, mom and dad, I've got a great deal. I, I'm gonna buy this thing, right? We'll, we'll fix it up, we'll refinance. It'll be a great investment. Come make money with me. My dad goes, you're out of your mind. We're not in, right? I'm going, holy smokes. I thought that would be like, help me out, somebody, right? The, the person that uh, I got 100,000 from my mother-in-law, God bless her, right? She had faith in me, no one else did. And then check this out, to close the deal, I had to go to one of the partners named Ron Tampkin, who had a credit line because he's got a huge portfolio. And I said, Ron, I need to close on this deal. I'll lose my earnest money, my deposit money. And he let me use his credit line to close the deal. And since refinancing, you know, I gave him back. But that's how it was. That's how the, the first deal is always the hardest deal, but there's capital out there. And it's just a matter of talking about it, knowing what you want, having clarity on what you want, and it's amazing. You write it down, which is what we're going to do today. Your brain is a powerful thing. You will find it. And that's where, that's why I put this general partner thing. In. So now I have a couple of properties. I'm an, I'm an investor in a few properties and things are going well. And I thought, you know, I want to be a general partner and in, in maybe gain some more properties, right? As uh, in, in being like the guy making decisions. So I wrote it down just like you guys are going to do today. I wrote it down. You start talking to people and it's amazing what your brain does. Within six months, I partnered with two guys from Lee and Associates. Sorry, everyone at Marcus and Miller Chat. Um, the president over there, Mike Tingas, said, Chris, we're buying an office building. You operate it. The Lee guys are going to buy it. You're an investor in it. You, me, this guy, Warren, we're going to be general partners. I go, holy smokes, this thing works. You write it down, folks. If there's nothing else you don't, you don't take from me today. If you take one thing away from me today, write down what you want. There's something magical. It's not just me in this stupid story. I learned it from someone. And we'll get into that in a second. Uh, but great question online. Uh, keep them coming in. So I think that's enough about me, right? I'm, I got three hours, so I got to you know, fill some time here. Uh, any questions? No, I gave you a pretty clear roadmap. So in other words, if I can do it, anyone can do it. And that's a true story. Um, so hopefully you're feeling a little uh, excited about that. So uh, our VP of service just walked in. Nice work. Um, so let's see. He just threw me off track. So, you know, I'm going to tell you why I'm here, but I, I, I already told you what I'm going to talk about. But I want to know real quick, and maybe you can type it in the chat too. Why are you guys here and what are you most interested in? Type it in the chat. Why are you here? What are you most interested in learning today? And maybe anyone here can just put a hand up and, and answer. I know why Brian back there is here. He wants to just make fun of me later uh, after three hours of teaching. Uh, come on, don't make me call on you. Yes, sir. I mean, real estate is a great way to uh, make money and invest and I want to learn more about it. Where do I Fantastic. So an investment. He's here to, to learn more about real estate and investing in real estate. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm here because I don't want to wake up when I'm 55 and realize that I've just spent half my life working for a company only to retire and live off of like 40000 a year off of 401k. Yeah. So I think real estate is the best way to do it. Financial freedom, it sounds like. Retirement, passive investment. I see some a lot of nods. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. Uh, if you can't hear him online, he's looking to buy a duplex uh, as soon as he can so he can live in it and rent the other one out. Great, great start. Great way to go there. 
Anyone else? Yep. Uh, the investment and also the school building to be created and those are some of the aspects of this that it just doesn't get in the way it's created. Sure. So on Zoom, he's saying just every so many different aspects of real estate uh, that he's interested in. And one more. Also finding ways to invest like in the younger flows in this time. Going to have that connection. Sure. Uh, in the portfolio, it's no doubt about it. Great. So a big investment, passive investment, what we're hearing, which is fantastic. Um, that's exactly what it is, right? You you get a portfolio going, you get to retire early, and, and you know, definition of retirement is do what you want. Anyone else? When you want to do. That's the that's the idea. Financial freedom. Well, thank you for sharing. Was there anything in the chat that anyone that throw on that's different, or is it mostly investment? I hope you're typing in the chat up there. Just passive, investment. passive investment. Very good. Good, good, good. So why am I here? Six human needs. Tony Robbins teaches me. But everyone can see them online right now. Certainty, we all need assurance. But at the same time, we all want some variety or uncertainty. Significance is feeling unique. Think about that for a second, right? What makes me different, right? Look at me, I'm, I'm significant. Then there's connection or love, right? A sense of belonging. And then we have growth or I'll refer to as progress, right? Personal growth, personal progress, and contribution. Contributing to something greater than yourself. When I was in college and through my 20s, living in Vegas, what do you think? By the way, every human has these same needs. The difference is we prioritize them differently, right? My two priorities when I was in, uh, in my 20s and in college, uncertainty and significance. And that's normal. It's not bad. It's not good, bad. Nothing's right or wrong here. But it's pretty shallow, as I learned when I got older. The idea, and, and I have three examples here that I want you guys to take away from this, is the involvement of you put yourself wherever that is. I'm just telling you my involvement as evolve or evolvement as, a, uh, uh, as an example, um, how I evolved over the years. So I do, I do some of these Tony Robbins seminars and then I realized real quick that as I got older and I told you, you know, my why with the, the shot of those boys up there earlier, it shifted from growth and progress to contribution. Giving something that's greater than yourselves. Don Miller, by the way, anything at the bottom, these are books. If you see small uh, detail at the bottom, I didn't mention that. If, you, if you'd like, I definitely recommend taking these books down and, and reading them at your leisure. Don Miller describes a similar evolution, but he says we are all authors and directors of our life. That's pretty cool, right? So who, who writes the story for your life? Who writes the story for your life? You, you. We all write the story. So he says there's four characters in every story that's up here. Victim, villain, hero, or guy. What's your story today? My story when I was in my 20s, I wanted to be the hero. Today, I want to be the guy. You could see how that evolves. None of this is right or wrong. I just thought it was amazing reading about it. Ray Dalio talked about three stages of life. By the way, his book is Principles. I think I have it up here somewhere on another slide. Depending on others, stage one, depend on others and learn. Stage two, others depend on you and you work. In stage three, no one depends on you and you don't have to work. You want to see people you care about succeed. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I still have people de depending on me and I still have to work. But it's for those three reasons, contribution, being a hero, I'm sorry, a guide, being a guide, and then also wanting to see other people around me succeed. That's why I'm here. And so I want to thank you guys for being here in person. I want to thank you guys for being on Zoom because I'm here just to watch you watch you guys succeed. And if I could be a guide and contribute in that sense, it's a, a blessing to me. So, so thank you guys for taking your time, taking the time out of your Friday with March Madness going on uh, to listen to me speak for three hours, hopefully two and a half. I'll try to get you out early. So the big message here is, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for allowing me uh, to speak to you today. So now we'll start getting into some, some meat and potatoes. Knowledge is not power, it's potential power. Knowledge is not mastery, execution is mastery. Execution will trump knowledge every day of the week. So today, I don't want you, yes, I want you to learn something. But it's not about the knowledge. I could tell you, all of us in this certificate program, the, the other seven that are presenting, we could tell you all the X and o, X's and O's, how to do it, right? What to do, how to do it, et cetera. But has anyone here ever been to a seminar or a class where you got this great idea and you were going to do it, but you did nothing? Good. Thank you for being honest. Put in the chat too. Say yes if, that's, if you've been there. I've done it. I've gone to you know trade shows and go, wow, great ideas. Right now I'm writing down, I'm excited. And then guess what? Life happens. Then you're back at home and you're back in your same routine. And those notes sit somewhere. So today I want you to know knowledge is important, obviously, but it's not execution. That's what I want you to take away from. That first deal I told you about, everyone told me not to do it, I did it, right? And I have some more stories on, on executing, but you learn by doing. Get involved, do it. If you have an idea and, you, and you're, you don't know how to do it, do it anyway, because that's how you learn. Don't let fear hold you back. So you can tell I'm a Tony Robbins fan, I already mentioned it. Everything you do, our two million old brains try to hold us back because of fear. There are three ways you can change your emotional state. Everyone like to be happy? Raise your hand if you like to be happy. Good. Do you guys know that happiness is a decision? If you think it's a decision, raise your hand. It is. Happiness is a decision. And things happen right to make us unhappy put yourself think of a situation where maybe you blew up emotionally could be with a friend a family member significant other whatever and something happened maybe even driving right let's use driving as an example have you been driving on the 405 someone cut you off and some days you're just like two fingers out the window screaming and honking and then there are days same thing happens and then there are days, oh, no problem. Everyone experienced that or no? Yeah, okay. That's all dependent on your emotional state. The emotional state is key for what we're talking about in real estate. So we'll come back to why I'm talking about this right now. But things happen in life and how you react to them is all emotional state. If you're in a good mood and you're happy and you're high on life, Someone could come over here and slap me. I go, oh, hey, how are you? My name's Chris. No big deal, right? But if I'm, in a, if I'm upset about something, I'm in a bad emotional state, I'll probably return a slap and say, what the hell was that for, right? The key is managing your emotions in all decisions. And these are three ways, another great tool to use throughout your life. Three things to do to control your state. Number one is physiology, how you use your body. If you are depressed or upset about something, what do you look like? Shoulders back or forward? Or hunched, right? Is your head down or up? Probably down, walking, right? This is the, the depressed look. 
So physiology, it has an effect on your brain. So one thing you can do, stand like Superman, right? And immediately that has an effect on, on your emotional state. So it's how you use your body. Number two is focus. What are you focusing on? You can imagine being one of my kids, right? When they when in the morning, right, they're pissed off at school and one's whining. What do you think I say if I'm making them breakfast or something? Change your focus, right? It's nonstop. Because if you're focused on today's beautiful day, Friday, today, if you said, oh, no, I got to, sorry, man, I, I got to you know, go to the certificate class you know, for three hours, right? Well, with that approach, it's probably going to make you a little depressed. So you got to change your focus. Or, hey, the good news is he's probably going to end it early so I can meet you at happy hour soon, right? So then all of a sudden, you're, you're uplifted. So change your focus of what, what's going on in your brain, right? What are you thinking about? You could take the same situation, focus on something positive, and it changes your emotional state. Third, language. If I say, how you doing? I have a rule at my house for, my, for all three kids, but my eight-year-old has the toughest time with it. I'll say, how was school today? What do you think? He says, good. I go, good the hell is that? And he goes, outstanding, dad, right? So the, the, the answer is outstanding. You change your language. If just by your, your use of your body, your focus, and how you use your language will change your emotional state, that's going to be key in managing people, making decisions. Can you do a real estate deal by yourself? No. So do you think your partners or any vendors are going to want to deal with a, a bad emotional state? No, that good emotional state will be a magnet. People will want to do business with you. Keep emotional state in mind. It's like a muscle. You got to practice it. It's not just something you say once and see it. If you practice this, it's a game changer. It's a life changer in everything you do. Now, what I'd like to do is pull out a piece of paper or if you're taking notes on your computer, I would love for you we're going to take a couple of minutes. Perfection is not an option. Perfection is an excuse not to do something, right? Perfection will hold you up. We're going to write down everything you want in life. That's pretty broad, right? You, if you're typing, don't stop typing. If you're writing, don't stop writing. It could be anything. It could be Significant other who you want to attract. It could be money. We talked about investments. Let's talk about what are some money goals? What is it that you want, right? Is it private jet? There's no limits here. So type away. You want to take vacations on a private jet? You want to have your own yacht, a boat? You want to go fishing? Maybe a dream vacation? Maybe buying your first duplex? Type away. I'll give you a couple of minutes. No right or wrong answers. I'm not going to ask you to share your notes. This is for you. I'll play some music for you guys if it, if it plays. Where are the places you, that you want to visit? Who do you want to visit with? Who do you want to take on those vacations? When do you want to retire? I'm just throwing out ideas, by the way. You know, these aren't real questions. I'm trying to spark some, some brain power. When are you going to buy your first home or your second home? What's your first investment deal? 
or maybe your second or your third if you already have your first. Don't worry about the how. This is just a fun exercise of everything you want in life. How much money do you want on a monthly basis coming from your passive income of real estate? And by the way, get specific too. You know, if that first deal is a duplex, where is it located? How many units if it's an apartment building? Kind of fun, right? Keep riding. What kind of car do you want to drive? All right. You guys enjoy that exercise? It's the, I know some of you are sending emails, not texting friends. Uh, okay, so in the chat, and anyone here, throw out one example of maybe that you wrote down. Could be anything. Remember, my example is I wrote down I wanted to be a general partner on a building. That was one of the things that I did, and it came true. Nobody? Is there anything in the chat? Independence. Independence. Great. Financial freedom, sure. Anyone else? Did anyone want to fly on a private jet? Did anyone take a, a cool vacation somewhere? Yes, where? Uh, well, I just said I want to explore different places around the world, like Italy, Paris. Italy, Paris. Good, yeah, get, get specific. All right, he's going to Italy and Paris. Um, try different foods around the world. Try different foods, heck yeah, why not? What else? Did anyone make a specific investment goal? Anyone buy anything? Someone bought something. Uh, I'm going to buy a fourplex here in LA. Fourplex here in LA. Fantastic. That will get, get specific, just like that. Fourplex in LA, I can already see it happen. It will happen. All you got to do is talk about it and keep writing it. Anyone else to share anything in chat? Time. More time, okay. And then another person said, want to create a startup which turns into a really big company. Yes, startup into a big company. Great to sell it off, maybe take it public, right? Those are the, the details. Maybe take it, be on Wall Street, right? Going public with your company, whoever wrote that. But then, of course, you got to be specific on, on which, uh, what kind of company, right? And all that good stuff. So now comes the uh, important part. We've got some goals, and that's where everything starts, right? These are outcomes. This is what we want to happen. Now, draw a line under that. And now I want you to write all the reasons why. Why is the stuff you wrote down important to you or to whomever else? Why do you want to achieve those goals? And there was a chat that said time. Time might be a lot. I want more time, right? So I could build a uh, real estate portfolio so I can have more time to do what I want to do, to give an example. Why do you want, who, who do you want to take the foods around the world with? Is that important? Is it for yourself? Is it for someone else? Maybe you want to buy a loved one a house or a car. So in that case, it would be for them. Wrap up in 30 seconds. 
think right down the why is harder than what you want. So we do this exercise on our uh, management retreats. Uh, and it's really cool to see your notes. For those of you who keep journals, keep it going. If you don't, buy a journal so you have a place to go back to your notes. Um, but it's really cool to go back a year, what you wrote down, and see what you achieved within that year and see how that changes the, the following year with your, with your new objectives. Uh, anyone want to share a why? Maybe put in the chat why you wrote down, the reasons behind it. We'll just take a couple of shares live if you don't mind. Anyone want to share why what they wrote down is important? Why you want that stuff? Um, I said I want to help other people, whether or not I actually know them. Good contribution. There you go. Leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. Great. Uh, being able to retire with you going. So, like, the reason why is just to find someone truly passionate about. Good, good. So back to retirement as investment. Fantastic. Anything on chat? So there are children in need, help homelessness. Tackle bigger problems. Good. We got volunteer in the back. Get back to the parents. Awesome. Awesome. The more specific you can get, right, the, the better the desire, right? And that's what we're aiming for here. So I'll share one. And so why are we doing this, by the way? Because remember, we talked about execution. Execution depends on your what. Everybody's the same. But the person that gets up at five in the morning to work out is just because they have a little bit more desire than the next. So we all have it. We just need to find it. And that's the challenge. I'll give you one quick example. And this goes back to Don Miller's book, The Storytelling, which kind of brings it all together. We all have our own multiple stories in our life. It's living that story, right? If you define yourself as a, a guide or hero, what have you, and in that story, you're going to behave. That's going to drive your behavior. So one thing, one of my stories or, or identities that I, I came up with is I want to be super dad, a super dad to my three boys. If you're going to be a super dad, how the hell do you have to behave? Not much room for error, is there? A, courage, right? Brave. Better go work out. Maybe I could use a little more of that, but right. Um, it, it really changes. It, 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 it's, it's a guide to how you behave because it's your identity. And it's the desire to be a super dad that drives me to do the things I do on a daily basis. And that becomes our, our values, right? And our principles, right? If I do this, are my kids going to be proud? Is that super dad? Probably not. All right, we better not do that. So it's that desire that will drive execution. So I don't expect you guys to figure that out today, but I just gave you the, the outline of writing down your goals, your outcomes, coming up with the why, because if the why is strong enough, you'll figure out the how. Make sense? All right, moving on. You're like, okay, is this psychology or real estate? Um, Asset classes. So these are some different uh, investment classes, right? Uh, financial vehicles, stocks, bonds, right? Fixed income. And then you have alternatives. Who invests in cryptocurrency? I know everyone does, right? Chat, do you invest? Put in the chat box if you invest in cryptocurrency. I've been burned so many times on Bitcoin. I said, screw it. Uh, and then there's so many different ones, right? And it's a fear of missing out. Remember, fear drives you. Fear will drive you to act too. And so I learned my lesson. I'm done with crypto. Um, and then you have art, and then of course, real estate is another alternative. That's what we're talking about uh, today. 
So here is one of Anthony's slides. Why real estate? You guys already saw this in, in the principles class. Well, I just want to focus on three. Number one, direct control over the investment. I love real estate as an investment because you have some control, especially as the operator, right? As, as from a property management standpoint, you have a lot of control. Do you have control in the stock you buy? Unless you know Elon. Hey, Elon, what, what's going on with production? Don't you come over there and, and try to hit numbers this, this quarter? No. You buy a stock and you hope it goes up, right? Um, in real estate, you have control. You have control over the operation, and that's what we're talking about today. You don't have control over pandemics, political effects, right? Any, any local jurisdiction on an investment. You don't have really supply demand control, right? Everyone says location, location, location. LA is going to be different than Bakersfield, which will be different from Phoenix, et cetera. Um, so there are some external factors, but the single greatest thing about a, a real estate investment, especially multifamily, is that you have an element of control. The more control you have, I mean, we're all control freaks, right? We're, we're humans. It's great. If you're going to give someone money, you want to have control over it. Or if you invest in something, you want to have control over it. Now, as Anthony mentioned, there's two disadvantages, or the two, there's two disadvantages I want to discuss that are highlighted in red. Those two disadvantages are what we're talking about today. With a good operation, those don't become disadvantages anymore. So the first one he highlighted, well, I'll start with complexity. Managing a building is fairly simple, conceptual. It does get complex when you have laws and you know city council voting things in every year, a couple times a year. And you just have to make sure you're dotting the I's and crossing the T's, right? So it just means more lawyers are involved, unfortunately, which is a greater cost, et cetera. So yes, it is complex. But as you guys know, if you have the knowledge of it, then it's easy to execute, right? Well, execution, got to execute. But if you have knowledge, then it's not complex, right? If you guys all have something that you know, maybe cryptocurrency, you could tell me what I was doing wrong. And I'd say, it's too complex for me. And you'd say, no, it's actually kind of easy, right? For, and that's based on your expertise. So similarly, from an operation standpoint, it's not that complex. Management burden, though. Who wants to try to define? I wish Anthony was here. Is Anthony on Zoom? Anthony, if you're on Zoom, why don't you type in management, the definition of management burden? What do you guys think it was from his class? Go ahead and say it. Pain in the ass? Yeah, that's a management burden. You know what else is a burden? Getting a call in the middle of the night, waking you up, right? Two in the morning, I got a plumbing issue. Right? Could you imagine how many emergency calls there are across 14,000 units in LA? A lot. Fortunately, I don't get them all. I do get some. Uh, management burden. And to give you an idea of management burden, anything in chat? Did Anthony? Is Anthony not there? <laughs> Taking care of repairs. That's right. It's a 24-7 job in operation. And that's why... Anthony put it up there as management burden. I've got a little video that's coming on next that will kind of describe what a management burden is. Now, this is uh, probably, this was pre-COVID. The people on the video uh, are two employees of, of Moss & Company. They put this together for one of our holiday parties to show to the, the rest of the group. And by the way, the funny thing about it, everything in here, they're like actors, filmmakers, right? So they put this together. Everything in this skit actually happened within our company. Enjoy. I'll play it plays. Oh, you guys can't hear it. Can you? For those who don't know, it's from Moscow. Moscow, we still have an escape person. Strong that song, so we thought we'd make a little video just to show how personal our job. Oh, let's try. We have Hugo here for backup. Hold on, folks. 
In fact, why don't we, uh, while we try to get this video going, uh, I would love to show it. It's actually kind of entertaining. Uh, let's do a, a six minute break. We'll be back here at two o'clock. We'll try to get the, uh, the sound, the audio working, okay? Use the restroom, do what you gotta do. Uh, six minutes. You should have audio Yes. Hey, Chris, when you when you share the video um, right at the very bottom left hand side of the screen, just click on um, share audio. Um, so unshare your screen and then reshare it um, with the button clicked at the very bottom. Which one? Can you see it? Um, no. So go ahead. Uh, it's Hugo there or Nancy. So Nancy, have him unshare his screen. Um, and then, because we are just sharing your screen, so unshare the screen and then reshare it. And when the box pops up to share, at the very bottom, um, just make sure that it, it you optimize for sound and all of that. There we go. Share screen. Share screen. Yeah. And do you think we could get the audio in the room or no? Or will it come on in the room? You think? It, it, oh, oh, right. Turn this up. No, because you're sharing from your computer, so it should, it should work. All right, well, do you want to, should we try it real quick? Sure. I don't hear anything. This is, oh, it's, you haven't shared it. Oh, I'm not trying to, oh, I have to share it. To should, get. Yeah, so try sharing got it. Got it, got it, got it. And Nancy, just make sure it, it, it um, it's like share the sound. Right. Whoops, okay, so. Everyone go to Zoom. Yeah, share, share, share sound. sound. And then click on the one that you want to uh, share the video. Yeah. Share. Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Mickey. And for those That's of you. Better. Okay. Thank you. Could you hear that one? Yeah. On Zoom? Came through. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Nice work. It's like a voice from above when she talks to us. I know, right? It's <laughs> great. Now, if I wanted to toggle it to an Excel spreadsheet, do I have to unshare and then unshare. click on it? Maybe I won't share. That's okay. Good enough. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. You can hear it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're good now. We 
didn't have the audio in here, but she she turned it up for us. Oh, I see. So did you hear? Yes, seventy online. All right. Only thirty of them left. Yeah. <laughs> I will go one more minute. One minute warning. Uh, I'm sure he's in the restroom. I don't, I don't think he, he may have. He had enough. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure he's in the restroom. He may have. He had enough. All right, we all set? Everyone online? Throw in the chat if you're ready online. Here is the video that we were trying to show. Hi, I'm Kevin. And I'm Mickey. And for those of you who don't know us, we're Moss and Company managers. Moss and Company's slogan is, it's personal. We believe strongly in that slogan, so we thought we'd make a little video just to show how personal our jobs can be. Hi, Scott. This is Mickey, your manager. I know you're moving out tomorrow. I just wanted to... I'm not moving. You're not moving. Did you change your mind? No. I have your 30-day notice. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that was just a notice that I was thinking about moving, not that I was actually moving. Okay, well, I'll cancel this, but know for the future that the 30-day notice lets us know when you're actually moving. Sorry, I have an incoming call. I have to go. Hello? Hey, Mickey. Unit 15 sink was backed up because there was a bunch of carrots that put down the garbage disposal and clogged the pipe. It's all fixed. Thank you for letting me know. Hello? Hi, Stacy. How are you? I'm fan flippin' tastic. Thank you. What's up? Did you cook with a lot of carrots recently? Absolutely. I was making three giant carrot cakes. My grandmother's recipe. Wow, I bet it tastes amazing. The thing is, did you put the carrot scrapings down the garbage disposal? I sure did. Well, I know they're biodegradable, so it's not gonna be a problem. Actually, it was. That's what clogged your sink. Oh no, I'm so sorry. It won't happen again. I appreciate that. Just remember, you shouldn't put anything down the garbage disposal. It's more for the loose scraps to come off your plates as you're doing your dishes. Have a good day. Okay. Bye. Remember, we don't have any guest parking, so your parking spaces are numbers 13 and 14. Thank you so much. Welcome home. <laughs> yeah. What the? Oh, hey. Yo, sorry about that. Jeez, the, the flames got out of control. It was crazy, so I just kind of shoved it out the balcony. I'll clean it up. Thank you, but we don't allow charcoal grills for that reason, and I'm glad no one was down here. They could have been seriously hurt. Please clean it up. And what makes you think, when you see my car parked there, that you can park there? Dude, chill. It's my first day. Chill. You're making me late. Can I help? Yes, you can make sure the tenants know where to park. He's making me late. Absolutely. I'm so sorry about that. Mark, your parking space is over here. Can you please move your car? No problem. Sorry about that. Thank you. Really? There you go. Uh, thank you. Is there any way I could just have an extra one of these so this doesn't keep happening? Sure, I just need to require another deposit. I have to pay for it. That seems ridiculous. Um, I pay rent to have a spot in the garage, so maybe you could just give me an extra remote. 
please. Sorry, I still need to require a deposit. It's the other tenants, right? Um, listen, I promise I won't tell them a thing. You can trust me. I still need to require a deposit. Fine. the Lower Canyon Apartments, professionally managed by Moss and Company. This is Mickey speaking. How may I help you? Yeah, I'm here at the apartments and I'd like to see the unit you have available. Currently, we don't have anything available, but I'd be happy to. Well, can I at least see your showing unit? Unfortunately, we don't have a showing unit, but I can... Okay, I'm here in your lobby and I can't find your leasing office. You guys should have a lot better signage. I'm sorry, we don't have a leasing office. You... Oh, you don't have a leasing office? Unfortunately, hello? Hi, Stacy. how are you? Hey, I just got home and somebody's storing some stuff in the garage and it's in the way. Thank you, I'll be right there. Mark, how's the moving going? Oh, good, good, but can we talk later? I'm just trying to get moved in and all. Do you happen to have a bunch of stuff stored in the garage by chance? Oh, is that a problem? Yeah, we don't allow storage except for in your apartment. I was just gonna leave it there till morning, but I can move it. I appreciate it, thank you so much. I need my mail and my friend's coming at 7 o'clock tonight to pick it up. I actually won't be available after 5 today. Can you come before then? No, he can come at 7 o'clock tonight. I'm sorry. Mickey, you know what? I'm busy working. And you're my manager, which means you work for me. So why don't you figure it out? Be here at 7 o'clock. Oh, and my wife and I got a pit bull. So uh, when I get back, have the paperwork ready. Pit bull? Hello? Uh, hello? Mark, how's the moving going? Good. I just want to let you know that our upstairs patio door needs to be repaired. Is something wrong? Well, we locked ourselves out. We saw you leave, so we had to kick the door in. You kicked the door in? Yeah. And uh, because it's a security issue, can you please send with someone today? Oh, ask about a hotel. Oh, yeah, but you know what? If you want, you can just put us up in a hotel room for safety. I'll give maintenance a call to have them come over and secure it, but I'm going to have to charge this to your ledger. What? You're going to charge us? But you weren't here, we had no choice. I'm sorry, Mark, but you could have called me or a locksmith. I will try to have maintenance take care of it so it keep the cost down. I, I, I guess we could talk about this later. I, I really think you're gonna come around. I'd be happy to. In the meantime, I'm gonna go and call maintenance, okay? Thanks. <sighs> Tears, skirt, blouse, go. Fine. <laughs> Hello? Hi, my name is Shelly calling from the Moss and Company emergency line for the Laurel Canyon Apartments. We have a tenant in Unit 9 who says there's water coming out of their fridge. Thank you for letting me know. I'll take care of it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Hello? Hi, Scott. This is Mickey, your manager. Awesome. Yeah, I just got back from the gym, and the water in my fridge is not working, so I need an emergency repairman up here right now. Wait, it's leaking water? No, no. The dispenser is not dispensing water, and I'm really thirsty because I just got back from the gym, so can you please send that repairman up here? I'm sorry. There's no emergency service for a refrigerator. 
in the first thing in the morning, I'll call a repairman to have it fixed. In the meantime, I would say drink anything else you have in the fridge, and I'll get it taken care of as soon as I can. <laughs> I don't have anything else in the fridge. I'm really thirsty. I just got back from the gym. And if I buy more water, is Moss going to reimburse me? I'm sorry, we won't be. Unfortunately, there's nothing more I can do until the morning. Well, we'll definitely be talking in the morning, bro. I'd be happy to talk in the morning. Thank you. I said holiday theme, but... This is holiday theme. I meant professional. As you can see, we believe in our slogan. It's personal. Pretty funny, right? I think that's the management burden that Anthony was, was referring to. Uh, and I thought that was a funny little thing they put together I'd share with you because that's exactly what sometimes, right? Uh, fortunately, not every day, but that that could happen in multifamily operation. Um, here, obviously, the main objective, right? This, this one you might want to uh, memorize. Uh, the asset and property management is just that, to maximize value. Now, as an owner, you might want to maximize cash flow. You might want to maximize value, right? The value of the sale, if you're planning on selling it, short-term hold, right? It's all big focus on value versus cash flow. That just basically means maybe you're going to put a little more investment in the property to increase the, the uh, rents. So when you sell it, you're maximizing its value. But that's the key to any operation. Anything we do as a property manager, our goal is to maximize the value of that property. Here was another slide from Anthony, just as a quick review of cap rates. Because when we talk about maximizing value, we got to understand what is value. And as you can see here from the principal's session, property value equals NOI divided by uh, cap rates, right? So remember that. Do you guys recall that from the, the class? The, what is a cap rate, et cetera? This was another slide defining cap rates. Cap rates, as far as I think we need to be concerned with, it's an external influence. So this is what Anthony shared with us in the first class. The lower the cap rate, the higher someone is willing to pay. Therefore, right, it's location in Manhattan Beach. You're not going to get a great return, a cash on cash return with these cap rates. So the lower the cap rate, the higher the value of the property. Do we have control of this as an operator? Do we have control of cap rates? No, external. That is given us by the market, by the neighborhood. Now, also from Anthony's deal, income minus expenses as highlighted there equals net operating income. We saw NOI as part of the value equation, right? So it's NOI divided by uh, your cap rate. That's going to be the value. So everything we do in operation and property management is just that. We're either trying to increase income or decrease expenses, therefore maximizing our NOI and therefore maximizing value. Now, I have a uh, Excel spreadsheet that I won't toggle back and forth with. I don't want to uh, you know, share and unshare. Um, but to give you an idea of what you can do as an operator, remember we talked about having control of the investment. Take any property as an example. If you're maximizing NOI, you're increasing value, right? So as an operator, that's our goal. We know that. An example is a 10-unit building. If you bought a 10-unit apartment building, let's say the average rent per unit was $2,000, right? 2,000 a month times 10, you get the idea, annualize it, et cetera. From an underwriting standpoint, or when you're looking at a deal, especially multifamily, now this could change, right? We're in a period of inflation that we haven't seen in a while. But generally speaking, you want to account about 40% of that total income is, is going to be your expense line item. You figure 40% of that income you're collected is going to be all expenses to run, maintenance, management, personnel, leasing, et cetera, right? That's a round number. To give you an idea of what the power you have as an operator, whether you're doing it yourself for, for a duplex or if, you're a, if you hire a property manager, if you increase those rents in that example, 10 units, $2,000 a month, if you increase rents 10%, how many people here think it's hard to increase rents 10%? Forget rent control and all that stuff. We'll talk about that later. 10% seems high, right? 
there are many properties out there that are managed by owners that do not like the management burden. So what does that mean? Can you imagine if you have a property 30 minutes away, you own it, it's 10 units, and somebody's moving out. What do you do as an owner when you get a notice? You're going, oh man, I got to advertise it. I got to show it. I got to screen somebody, get the good tenant, and I got to lease it. So what ends up happening, human nature, they don't want to be bothered with it. So you will be surprised that a lot of owner manager, that's a term that you'll hear in the, in the uh, real estate world. It means the owner is managing it. There are many owner managed buildings out there that are under rented. And what I mean by that, they're not getting the top dollar of the market. Why? Because of the management burden. It's a pain in the ass. So that means, so in that example, if you find the right building, they're 10% under market. They may or may not know it. They may know it and not care, but they're done with it. They're selling it and you get to find it as the investor. And you're going to buy that building. There are rent control laws. I'm happy when we get into Q, Q and A, we'll dive into rent control, anything you guys want. We're just kind of keeping it a high level here. So throw rent control out for a second. If you buy that thing and you're able to, when, the, when they move out or right away, if you're able to increase it 5%, but let's say after a year, you're able to increase it 10%. Some stats, when we take over a property of an owner managed building, just to put things in perspective, we'll increase rents in, after 12 months, 13%. So what does that mean to value? In that example, 10 units, 2,000 units, blah, blah, blah. 10% increase in rental income is equivalent to $360,000 of value. So just like that in the year you can make by doing nothing else. That's all internal, right? It's not external. It's assuming cap rates don't go crazy, but from an external standpoint, nothing changes. It's just better operation. You just increase the value of that property by 300,000, over $300,000. When you multiply that by bigger buildings, get into a 50 unit building or a hundred unit building, that's where all the big institutional money is. In a hundred unit building, it's over $1.8 million. Or is that 50? I have it in the Excel. But you get the idea, the element of control on the, on the uh, rental income. Maximizing income, you are making just a small percentage on the income, you're making a big difference from a value standpoint. And that's the name of the game. This has been the play for real estate investors in Los Angeles for the last 10 years. They call it value add. They buy something, 60s, 70s, that's probably poorly, poorly managed or, or poorly run, or maybe they just didn't you know, uh, keep it up. So there's a lot of uh, deferred maintenance. Investors come in, buy this stuff. They redo the common areas, they're, they're renovating the, the units, and they're getting upwards of 30 or 40% higher rents on the new units versus what they bought it at. So you get the idea. There's a lot of money being made. It's been happening for the last 10 years. So it's great that the institutions are doing that, right? You're saying, okay, that's a 100-unit building. Well, how do I get started in that? I'm not going to certainly start with 100 units. I don't blame. But... The key to finding a deal, whether it's a duplex, a 10 unit, eight unit, whatever it is that you're going in on, here's the secret. You want to find a good deal? Find one that's poorly operated. And it's hard to find one that's poorly operated because you got to get into the financials. But when something's on sale, guys, CoStar, what have you, any, any broker, you know, marketing piece, it's going to show you what their current rents are. And you guys will have the tools to know the, the area, the neighborhood, to see what the market rents are, right? And then you can see the upside, potential upside. And it all can be done and controlled with good operation. And that's how you make money fast in real estate, just by the control of the operation, increasing income in that example, or the other way is, is decreasing expenses. Any questions on the value formula? NOI divided by... Uh, cap rates. Any questions on that? I know that's a little bit of a review. Um, what else do I want to? No questions on that. When you maximize revenue, actually, before we move on, now on the flip side, 
kind of giving it more current events right now. What's happening to inflation right now? Through the roof. I read something right now it was seven, seven and a half, high sevens. I read something from a forecast that uh, this year we'll see another 2% increase on the existing. So now we're talking, if that's accurate, we're talking nine, 10% inflation. How do you think inflation might affect your real estate investment from an operation standpoint? Will it help or hurt when everything, cost of goods and services is going up? I think that I think your numbers might get a little bit higher, but overall the purchasing power you get from that is going to be a lot better. Yeah, so definitely real estate is a hedge on inflation, what you're referring to, but think of just operations. So what you said is the cost of goods, goods and services will go up. Right. So we just talked about from a value standpoint, if your rents are not going up and your, your expenses are going up, what happens to your value? NOI goes down and value goes down, right? That's why there's a big debate right now in the city and county of Los Angeles. The local jurisdiction is saying they just extended the um, eviction moratorium. And with that, there's a rent freeze for 12 months after the emergency ordinance is lifted. So right now in LA, um, the Greater Los Angeles Apartment Association uh, filed suit against the county of LA. And what they're arguing, guys, is if an apartment owner can't increase rents, and now your, your expenses are increasing and their, their rents are frozen. And at this point, depending on how this shakes out, it's for till June of 2023. What happens to, to values? They go down. What happens to your cash flows? They go down. So is the local government important thing to keep in mind where you invest? For sure. It shouldn't scare you away. Remember we talked about fear. Don't let it scare you away from a from a neighborhood or a city it just means you need to know what effects that they might have what policies might come down that might affect your operation or your investment and that's actually happening right now in fact there's a show uh, california insider that i was just uh, in studio and they interviewed me on it i think it's coming out uh, tomorrow and i know everyone's heard of california insider probably nobody it's probably a, a YouTube channel or something. But anyway, that's the big thing right now in, uh, in our world, in the multifamily world, this, this lawsuit. Um, so as the slide says, if you maximize income, minimize expenses, right? You're creating big value. And here's another great book, Raving Fans, down at the bottom. If you have a, and this goes across all industries, if you have a satisfied client, they will leave at their first opportunity. If you have a raving fan, they are with you for life. So keep that in mind. If you have investors, you want them to become raving fans. Any industry you go into, if you have customers, clients in, in uh, apartments, you want raving fan residents, right? Uh, great book. So I, I definitely recommend you guys uh, check that out. So everything we're talking about as an operator is, is revenue and expenses. So by the way, I, 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 didn't, I didn't mention this. I know we're talking about more multifamily, but commercial uh, versus residential, you guys have probably seen this in principle, but I just wanted to list it anyway. Uh, let me know if you have any questions on that. So he, what it, by throwing, put it in the chat, what are different revenue streams? If we're talking about maximizing revenue in multifamily or apartments, how do you maximize Revenue. What are the different revenue streams out there that you guys may or may not? We already talked about getting maximum rent, right? Or market rent. Throw it out. Uh, you pay for parking. parking. Good job. I think that's exactly the next one. Huh, look at that. As if you knew. Yeah, go ahead. Laundry. Laundry. Yes, keep them coming. Anything in the chat? Here are a few. Laundry, you mentioned. Pet rent, anyone have pets? You gotta pay rent for them, right? You know what this industry, by the way, this never used to be in apartments. 
But just like any industry that attracts investment and a lot of money, just like in the last 12 years in LA, a lot of money came, came into our market from a, for a real estate investment standpoint. All this stuff you start, I don't want to call it nickel and diming, but it's like the airlines, right? Depending on the season, the time, the demand, you will pay a higher price, right? And then they charge you for bags. And if you, if you want water these days, I think they're charging you for water, for a bag of peanuts, et cetera. So that's kind of what, what's happening in, in our world. Now, if you, what, why is this relevant? If you're buying a building or investing and you're looking at the pro forma of something that you might purchase, if you know that you have all these different revenue streams, maybe the operator currently is not charging for something that you can charge for to again, increase your value. Most are doing it now, but oddly enough, the utility bill back, some people still are not billing for that. That is called uh, RUBS, an acronym for Utility Billing Service. And basically, if you guys are in apartments, you might know about it. It's most apartment buildings are master metered. They're not sub metered. So basically what the owner is doing is taking 80 to 90% of all water usage, right? So they cut about 10 to 20% for common area and they pay for that. But 80 to 90% is being passed through to the renter. And that would be utility bill back. When we take over our operation and we implement utility bill back, we immediately increase value uh, for, for that client. Uh, again, rent control laws, let's get in detail, but we could go over that in Q&A. Um, but these could be gold for you guys when you're looking at uh, investments and what to invest or what not to invest. This is upside. So uh, this is important from an income standpoint. The other side is pretty simple, minimizing uh, expenses. So this would be a little bit of a challenge, right? That's why I think most of the focus is uh, on income for smaller buildings. What can you do? What upgrades can you put into a unit to get higher rents to increase the value of your property? From a, an expense standpoint, um, this is where it helps if you have a manager, a, a professional company with a large portfolio. Right, because your goods and services, you're pretty much going to get a better deal, economies of scale, with somebody that has 20,000 unit, units under operation versus maybe somebody that has 200 units of, uh, under operation. So, this is really where Moss and Company, myself, and our team, we have to differentiate ourselves here. We have to constantly look for efficiencies, we have to constantly keep our vendors in check through the bidding process, because like anyone, they get comfortable, they think we're raving fans, and next thing you know, they're charging us too much. And then they're wiped out because another vendor will save our clients money. So um, this is actually kind of a fun thing on the operations side, because we're always looking for uh, efficiencies. And we'll get into it later, but because of all this money that came into real estate investment, guess what follows the money? Technology. This has been a great industry for all you uh, tech folks out there from, uh, we'll go through it, but you know, hands-free everything, everything on an app these days, uh, it, it's pretty cool from an operation standpoint. Here's an important slide. Five categories to change to make any business successful. So whether you're looking at apartment building that we're talking about as a hypothetical example of an investment, now I say five, I added the six processes, but the first five uh, is what's being referred to the five categories. So if I refer to it as a sixth category or six categories, then processes is in there, which I think is very important from a uh, apartment operations standpoint. But take any business in any industry. If you're buying it, you want to improve it, you go work for them, whatever it is your position and you want to bring value, if you add value uh, to that business, you're going to get compensated for it, right? So every job you go into, whether it's an internship now, any job you're in now, or after you graduate, think of these five areas of improvement. So, and we'll go into each one of them uh, in detail, but from a real estate standpoint, there's only a few that we have control over. So first off, product from a real estate standpoint, is you know what real estate asset is it? This is all just kind of the, the physical uh, of the building. Is it retail, multifamily, or office? You know, is it high end or low end? I don't know if this was gone over before. 
but we refer to you know class A, B, and C. That's just kind of high end versus uh, versus low end. Um, and then question at the bottom is how much influence as an operator do you have on the product? That's your buy, right? That you're looking at something, the, the type, the location, right? A, B, or C, yeah, you could put money into it. But if you're gonna buy something, how much influence do you have on, on that product that you're buying at purchase? A little or none, zero, 100%. Can you change a, an office building into an apartment building? I guess you could, but it'll take some money, right? So bottom line is that from an operating standpoint, you don't have much influence over the type of asset it already is. How about place? Where is it physically located? That's certainly important depending on your goals, what have you. Do you have influence as an operator uh, on, on the location of the building? Yes or no? Can you, can you pick up a building and move it? No. So you don't have influence on the price, uh, place. How about price? So this goes back to our income from an operation standpoint. Now, price is, is obviously something we do have influence on. Um, how do you guys think you find uh, the price of a rent? Uh, by show of hands, how many have uh, shopped for an apartment building? Okay. When you shop, you're probably online, right? Looking for something. Are you guys looking at, at price for a given area? Certainly, right? Um, and of course, there's services and amenities and such. But you're going to know for generally speaking, what a one or a two bedroom apartment is in Westchester or, or Marina Del Rey, right? When you're looking, that's how knowing the comps, we're going, reviewing the comps, knowing the, the market essentially. And this is big from an operation standpoint. If you have, when we get into KPIs, key performance, uh, you know, our measurements of our operation, we talk about occupancy, we talk about vacancy factors, right? We talk about income in, uh, expenses out, et cetera. And price has a, has a huge, is a huge factor when it comes to occupancy. And do you guys think COVID had a uh, effect on price? For sure. We have some key measurements we'll go over later. You guys will see a good illustration of what COVID did to the apartment world uh, in LA specifically. By the way, price, it's easy to, to find with the internet. You guys could look up, if you're looking at a specific building, whether to live in or to purchase, craigslistapartments.com, anything online, you could really get to know the market. Zillow is another big one these days. Hot pads, I know there's a bunch. Um, promotion is another P. Promotion slash, slash marketing. So it's understanding as an operator, once you have the, the building you, you got, you set your price, et cetera, you need to understand who your target market is. You know, is it in Culver City next to Apple, right? Are we targeting Apple employees? Is it in Westchester right next to LMU? Are we targeting students, uh, et cetera? Um, there's some buildings 55 and older, older, right? You're gonna be targeting potential retirees, uh, what have you. So it's understanding your target market. This goes all back to your, your marketing classes here at, uh, at LMU. But I think the, the main takeaway is a good promotion brings more demand. You're just trying to get the, the building that you're marketing, maybe it's brand new construction. Uh, you have to get the word out because the higher demand for your building or your, your vacancy, what happens to the price? Very simple, supply demand, we already know about it. The less people interested in coming to look at your, your vacancy, then you're gonna have to lower the price at the end of the day. So price and promotion are kind of a correlation uh, depending on what your goals are. But some of the more, uh, I'll give you some specifics in LA. Um, where do you guys normally look for uh, finding an apartment? Where have you looked in the past? Zillow, Zillow's a good one. Anyone else different? Put in the chat, uh, wherever you look for an apartment building, the last apartment you looked at. Apartments.com is big. They're spending a lot of money. I think they had Super Bowl commercials uh, a couple of years ago. 
Okay, so if you are investing in LA, I will tell you that from a marketing standpoint, sources, the number one source is your property website. Interesting. Number two, depending on kind of class A, class C, et cetera, is either uh, Zillow for higher end or Craigslist for a little lower end. And then you have apartments.com, which is also a big player from a lead generation standpoint. Um, I think the important takeaway is your property needs a website. Unless it's you know small, if it's really small, you don't have to worry about it. But if it's larger, because what happens when you guys find or whoever is searching for an apartment, they find something on apartments.com, Zillow, what have you, and then immediately they Google it. And then they're going to your website because they want to see more pictures. They want to probably check out some reviews, et cetera, right? Online reputation is, is an uphill battle in the apartment world because like anything, most people that are pissed off are going to go online and scream about it versus the ones that are, are necessarily raving fans. But uh, I think that's an important factoid uh, that folks will want the apartment uh, market now. They want to check you out, check out the website, check it out online before they ever make a phone call. And maybe you guys have done that. Fifth P is people. Now I know we're talking about real estate in general. So, you know, there's a in the first investment that, you know, maybe you operate it yourself, what have you, you're not dealing with people. But when you get to scale, like, um, like at Moss with 14,000 14, units, we have to have the right teams. And this is this obviously is for any industry. Um, you got to have the right people. Keep that in mind. Uh, if you guys start your own companies, you guys go join a company. Check out their culture. Make sure they have the same values as you, uh, and you'll be happy. Whatever industry that is. But from from a real estate standpoint, if you think about why people are so important, if there's a brand new building down in Maria del Rey, and you're thinking maybe moving in there for next school year, the people you meet and show you around and, and lease you that apartment. Uh, is that a big factor or a small factor? Probably pretty big, right? More importantly, in LA, the average uh, multifamily unit is, is less than 40 units. So when you get these smaller buildings, you don't have full-time staff, right? The operation, it just can't, can't afford it. So then you have part-time people potentially. And if, if that uh, phone is not picked up when you finally do call after checking out online, what happens? Click, right? 75% no voicemails in our industry. They want instant gratification. There's so much to choose from in the list of apartments. You call, no answer, they're on to the next one, right? And we'll talk about some technology uh, that has come out in the last uh, few years and how we're addressing that. But um, so the, the onsite team is key. Accessibility is key of people. So if you have a smaller building, 10, 20 units, you don't have someone there on site with a leasing office, you got to have someone answering the phone or you're losing money with marketing dollars, right? Your, your occupancy or your vacancy will suffer and you're going to have to spend more money in marketing to gain more demand. So when, when, I, when I talk about people, just because of our size, we have, we have just under 400 employees at Moss in, in Los Angeles. So what I threw down here is, is something that will save you a lot of time and money. And remember back at the beginning, don't just tell me X's and O's, but tell me some things that maybe you learned painfully. So this book called Who, any industry, you guys start your own companies, you need to hire, read that book because we developed our whole hiring process at Moss around this book. And then of course, from a people standpoint and culture, you got to have a great culture to attract great talent and to retain talent. And that book is called The Happiness uh, Advantage. Uh, two great books. Um, not only do you have to hire the right people, um, but then you have to support the people um, with management staff, right? And that's where the culture uh, comes into play. And this goes for, for any company, but uh, personnel is key. And I think, to give you an idea of culture, have a culture video here. Hopefully it all works out. When you're looking for a new job or career, it's about finding the right fit. 
And at Moss, the right fit isn't a business proposition, it's personal. Our people come from many different backgrounds, but they have a lot in common. They insist on being heard. They take pride in having an impact, and they're not afraid to make unique contributions. At Moss, we thrive on diversity, and we depend on our people to give us a wide range of perspectives to every opportunity and problem that come our way. We believe that the best idea should always win, no matter where it comes from. But a great idea can't win if it's not heard by the right people. So, at Moss, we have an open door policy that goes all the way to the top. Our people want stability and security, and we give it to them through practical training and support programs, each designed to fuel their ambition, expose them to opportunities, and build their careers. Moss & Company is a family-owned company, and we live by seven core values, which are the soul of our workplace community. We're looking for team players who are willing to be fearless in the pursuit of what sets us apart. We want creative individuals who can push ideas beyond boundaries and then take the initiative to be the solution to the problem. We want competitive individuals who inspire greatness in others, but also know how to show empathy and make a real difference in people's lives. Most of all, we want people who have passion in everything that they do. Moss & Company continues to grow, and if you join our team, so will you. Because at Moss, it's personal. So no, I'm not trying to recruit everyone and use this as a, I just wanted to show you how people though um, are so important in the process of operations. So we actually have put that recruiting video together that lives on our, on our website. Um, the sixth P that, that we're reviewing is processes. Every business, all businesses is a process, right? And then Cami, write that down. Continuous and never ending improvement. That's the challenge. In anything and everything we do, in your personal life, in professional life, that's what we strive to do. When you think you have it all figured out, start over, right? And that's what processes uh, come into place. So you have to figure out, you know, what do you do differently? So again, from an operator standpoint, and even think about getting into your first deal. If you're looking for investors, why would an investor give you money and not someone next to you doing the same thing, right? And that's where you have to come up to differentiate yourself with different processes. Um, you know, the other question is, can we do the same thing better? How can we increase efficiencies? What technology can we leverage? So we will get into technology a little later in this um, in the industry. But to give you an example, we just talked about accessibility and people. And this is pretty exciting for us and always kind of going down the same idea of always wanting to improve. What do we do different? So let me give you a couple of stats. These are interesting. This is the LA market specifically. 52% of calls to apartment buildings go unanswered, over half. Isn't that wild? Think of all the marketing dollars. When I was driving over here, I actually asked our, our marketing director, I said, how much money with all the, the units you know, do we spend on a monthly basis? And it was 240,000 a month. Isn't that wild? In marketing. So if you're not, if you don't have the people to answer the phone, and 75% of those aren't leaving a message, would you say that's money down the drain? Right? Absolutely. So understanding that as an industry issue, that's an industry issue across the board. That's where asking these questions, what do we do differently? What can we do differently to ensure our real estate performs better? So we came up with a... Uh, it's actually now being marketed uh, where it's be becoming more common uh, in the industry. But this idea was born um, over a year ago uh, at kind of the think tank uh, uh, meeting that we had at Moss. And it's a whole concept of centralized leasing, right? In other words, if half the calls go unanswered industry-wide and they're not leaving messages, we need someone to answer that phone. And if it goes unanswered, we need the technology to know exactly what phone number it was, when they called, et cetera, to ensure and have a system, a CRM system, to know that who got back to them and when. And we have to do it within 24 hours or we lose. 
So we launched with the help of a technology company um, called Anyone Home, and it's specific to our industry. So we launched a centralized leasing team. And basically what it is, is a kind of a lead catch all CRM. Phone calls come in, it's all logged, when it comes in, et cetera. Calls are recorded. We know if it was answered or if it, if it went unanswered. And if it goes unanswered and not returned within six hours, we have a, a leasing team, centralized leasing team that will follow up with a phone call that said, sorry, we missed, missed your call. What can we have for you? Right? So it's, it's that advantage. If you think about the sheer size and volume and number of calls, we have, we have on any given month, depending on the month, because there is some seasonality with apartments, uh, apartment search, we'll have anywhere from as low as 11,000 calls, leasing calls per month to as high as 18,000 calls. So that those marketing dollars, right? Each call is has a cost to it. And we have to do a good job. Any building has to do a good job in making sure we're answering that phone. And if we miss it, that somebody's following up. So that just gives you an idea of kind of thinking outside the box of what can you do different and what technology can you use to leverage. And any of you guys that are really into technology, you know, you don't have to love operation. You might want real estate as a, as a passive investment, as we talked about, but understanding just like in any industry, the problems, and you could come up with a solution. There are a lot of startup companies um, that have, that have really been born in the last uh, three to four years in the apartment world. And they continue to come out today trying to address these industry issues. So we're getting into measurements. We'll finish this slide. We'll do a quick break so you guys get the blood flowing again, get in the right mental state. Um, measurements. This is a, a great slide for you as an investor, as an owner, as an operator. What do we look at on a daily, monthly, you know, weekly, monthly basis? So from an operation standpoint, I think the biggest red flag is what we call in our world. What's the, the greatest red flag that a, a client, right, an owner of a building will say, Chris, you're not doing your job. And the biggest red flag is occupancy, right? Right now, anyone know what the occupancy is in LA? 97, 98%. All apartments in LA. Do you guys know what it was before the pandemic? Average 95, 96. So occupancy is actually higher. Demand is actually stronger today than prior to the um, prior to the uh, pandemic. Uh, higher occupancy typically means what? Higher prices, right? There's a market uh, uh, external factor there. So occupancy is key. You can also look at occupancy as vacancy, right? Same thing. You can look at 98% occupancy, or you can look at 2% vacancy. I personally look at vacancy. Anything that's over, you know, with a with a market like this, anything that's over 4% vacant is going to be on our radar as an operator. Um, now, this is interesting how, how industries change or pivot with the pandemic. Do you think rent collections was number two before the pandemic? No. Rent collections was always at 99 point something percent uh, because that's part of the tenant screen, right? People are paying. During the pandemic, they announced that eviction moratorium right in LA, and they said, and they said uh, you don't have to pay your rent if you've been negatively affected by COVID, which is true. People needed help during the pandemic. You know, it's not good or bad. I think it's good for people that need it. But what do you think happened? To all what did all the apartment owners do and operators when they heard that people don't have to pay rent if they've been negatively affected? I think everyone has been negatively affected. Right? In some way, somehow. It could be a, a family member, right? It, it could be a job thing. It could be an industry thing. Whatever it is, I mean, we were all affected. We had to wear masks. We had to do Zoom, right? Everyone was negatively affected. So it was a very broad definition if you've been negatively affected. In LA, it's self certified, which means LA, you did not have to provide proof to your landlord that you were negatively affected, right? Income wise or what have you. So when this came out, I'll never forget. I was driving at the time. I was probably white as a ghost thinking, 
as an operator standpoint, during this whole thing, everyone's thinking landlord and renter. Managers, us, we get paid based on what we collect. Our management fee is based on what we collect. So I actually was doing the numbers of what percentage do we need to collect to ensure I could pay everyone seven. It was a scary, scary time. Fortunately, most people pay. But, you know, back in March 2020, the effect of, of the pandemic got greater. So the collections did go down. At its worst point for our portfolio, which is a decent sample size, I know some, you know, buildings, individual buildings were not a problem. Some were bigger problems than others. But to give you an idea, at the worst part of collections um, was 85%, 84, 85%. So that means 15, 16% were not paying at a given time. The good news, we were able to, to keep our operation and, and pay everyone. Um, but the bad news, depending on the property and their, and their loans and their expenses to keep that property running, right? They were, a lot of our owners were scared. So obviously from a measurement standpoint, collections went right up there with, with vacancy factor from a measurement standpoint. We continue uh, to measure collections uh, as a key uh, measurement, uh, just because, as I mentioned earlier, it's extended again. We'll get into more of that and some of the current events so you guys know, what, know uh, what's happening in the LA market. Uh, so rent collections. And then the other thing that we always want is customer service. The better the service, better the rents, right? At the end of the day, the happier the residents, the more they're willing to pay, the more they're willing to stay there. So customer service is huge in apartments. It's, it's almost, a, almost hotel in some of these high-end buildings. It's more like hospitality. It's like operating a hotel which is a lot different than it was 15 years ago in our business, right? The old school apartment way was put a sign outside your door, say vacancy, you, you show it, you rent it, you're done. Uh, now it's, you know, concierge services, uh, doorman services, uh, valet services, et cetera, on some of these higher end buildings. So we measure uh, service through online um, reviews, right? We also have a talk about technology we use a company called BirdEye and they do uh, resident surveys. So that's how each building will have a measurement of surveys of residents and online reviews. We wrap it all up to a property score and that's how we measure customer service. And that's part of online reputation. I only highlighted a few of these just to, to go over them. So those are more of the operational, I think the key red flags, if you will, uh, when it comes to apartment operation. But then you also have financial measurements. So we want, as an operator, as a building owner, you want raving fans as residents. You also want raving fans, if you're an operator like us as a, as a property manager, you want raving fan clients. Now, how do you get raving fan clients? Financials, value, just like we talked about before. But so some of those measurements, I love looking at year over year rent growth. Throw a pandemic in the mix, it screws all your measurements up, right? That's just the way it is. Uh, but without a pandemic, you could see, are we increasing rents, the income of that building with the general market, right? What is the general market? Well, the nice thing about having 14,000 units in LA is we have a great benchmark. We have averages across that, that portfolio. So we come up with a benchmark and anything above the benchmark, we give a thumbs up. Everything below the benchmark, that's where all of our management team is to figure out what to do to get those rents up. So year over year rent growth is key. Uh, total revenue growth. Oh, yes, question. Thank you. Yeah, so, Please. Okay, I just wanted to know maybe a couple more. Uh, are you the owners of all 14,000 units or are you co-managing um, units that Moss owns? And, um, Good question. So the question is, of the 14,000 units, does Moss and Company own them all or do we, or do we operate? Moss and Company is 100% fee managed. So that means we do not own them. We operate them for other owners. Um, great question. I wish, I wish we owned 14,000 units. I would give you guys all a ride in the helicopter uh, after the presentation. Go ahead, another question. Yeah, so one more question. Like, so do you uh, entirely control the rent price or do you like discuss it with the owner? 
Good. Yeah. Okay. So the question is from uh, valuing the rents. Uh, do we do we do it ourselves or do we discuss it with the owner? Uh, the answer is it depends. Most of our clients don't want to really be hands on, right? So we will do everything A to Z for them, and then as I say, they collect their checks and we do a martini lunch once a year, right? Um, and then there's institutional type clients where you have the asset manager that I mentioned at the beginning, and they want to know everything. We're working off of a budget. If we, if we go off that budget, if there's a variance, there better be a good explanation. We're typically on the phone with them on a weekly basis, letting them know everything that's happened within the week. And if a vacancy is coming up or unit turns, we will discuss with the asset manager or the owner in that case, uh, what price that we would recommend and if they're on board. And um, all that really comes down to owner strategy of, of what they want. Because right, as an operator, our job is to maximize value like we talked about, but different owners have different strategies. Some are short-term, some are long-term. That will change the operation a little bit. But so to your question, some are involved and some aren't. Any other questions? Great questions. All right, anything in chat? Go ahead. Um, can I actually ask, uh, how does Muscle Co. determine the, uh, the revenue that they're gaining based off of how they manage the uh, owner's property? So, so specific to the management company revenue? Is that what you're talking about? Right, yeah. So how do we, what was the question? How do we measure? How do we determine? So uh, what I'm saying is the, they own the building. Right. And the rents technically would go to them. How does Mossing Co. specifically take their revenues from what they're collecting? Oh, I see. So as an operator, right, any fee managed operator, we collect all the rents. We, we have a bank account under, right, in care of the uh, a trust account for the ownership. And then at the end of the month, everything we collect, we do the financial reports. We send them the financial reports. And in a management agreement, there's a set de de a deter a determined price, predetermined price of what our fee is on a monthly basis. Most operators, there's a percentage of gross revenue collected, meaning you take this much money in that month, our fee is a percent of that. Makes sense. And that percent, by the way, which is a great question in general, and I think I have it on the slide, but I'll go to it anyway. In the market, it could be anywhere from, you know, if it's a huge building, industrial, you know, triple net, industrial stuff. Uh, in other words, easy to manage. And then you have something as labor intensive as like, there are some property managers out there that do Airbnb for single family homes. If you have a single family home that you want to Airbnb, you could pay a manager to do that. We don't do that, but that fee could be as high as 20%. So it could be as low as 2%, on a management fee uh, of gross collected income versus high as 20% of something like an Airbnb. In a broker's world, if they're advertising a building for sale, it, depending on the size, probably average is 4%, um, maybe 3% depending on, on the size of the building, but that gives you an idea. It's usually a percentage of gross collected income, two to 20, does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Questions? For uh, what term rentals? Short term rentals, sure. So, uh, short term rentals, uh, similar to what we refer to as like an Airbnb type thing or VRBO, we, we all know those. Um, the only difference of a short term and longer term, you know, 12 month lease for shorter term, is, is just it's a lot more labor intensive, right? That's why a, an operator of um, Airbnb, as an example, single family homes, they might charge up to 20% because they're going in, they got to clean, they got to get keys, they got to let people in. They, you know, I'm sure there, there's technology now for it, but it's much more labor intensive for every move in, move out type thing, right? Uh, and transaction. Um, that's the main difference uh, of short term versus long term. I think the other thing to, to keep in mind, which by the way, I know a lot of friends making a lot of money on Airbnb, a lot of first year type stuff. First year returns that you frankly can't get in multifamily work. So for you that you guys that are, are looking at investing, I would definitely look at that Airbnb stuff with friends, uh, a house, condo, what have you. Here's the key, right? There's always risk. With, with high returns comes high risk. As you guys know, there are different jurisdictions that says that put the kibosh on short-term you know, rentals. Santa Monica's one uh, as an example, right? Nothing less than 30 days. So when you hear short-term rentals, it could be nightly stuff, you know, through Airbnb. And then there's uh, 
so you know what's sometimes referred to as corporate housing, which is furnished housing, which will be uh, anything uh, like 30 days, you know, greater than 30 days. That would also be considered short term. But the only difference of short term versus longer term is it's more labor intensive, and therefore probably you would have to pay an operator a little bit more money. Question. So I know you guys are a property management company, not a site management company. Yeah. Um, but from your experience uh, managing a lot of large companies, what have been some of the winners you've seen? Struggles and like, like you, like, the, I guess that's the question. What, what trends have you seen going on? Good question. And if you don't mind, I'm going to save that question towards the end because I want to get a break in. Then we'll come back, we'll wrap up the presentation, and then we'll get into question and answers, more generic like that on, on specific returns and, and size of buildings. If you guys wanna hear about some home runs, uh, happy to share those with you, get, get a little inspiration, right? Um, so let me just wrap this measurement up. Is there anything else in the chat? Okay. So we talked about year-over-year -year rent growth, uh, revenue growth, so the difference of, Rent growth and revenue growth. What do you guys think? Both are revenue. But one encompasses the other streams of revenue like we talked about. The parking, the pet rent, et cetera, right? So I always love looking at rent growth because that's specific to rent and specific correlation to our on-site team. Whereas, you know, the, the total revenue, very important, but that's going to be a factor of maybe number of pets there, which is kind of a you know, factor outside of the on-site team chance. Um, utilities during the pandemic 2020 utilities spiked why because everyone was home right so when utilities spike the pass through the income on the utility right revenue also went up so if you just looked at revenue it's not the full picture that's why I like to look at rent versus total revenue and then here's another great one that you may or may not be familiar with expense to income ratio I mentioned at the beginning of this, when you're looking at a property, you probably want to assume about 40% expenses on total revenue. That's basically an expense to income ratio. So we have benchmarks across the portfolio. Anything under that benchmark, we got to focus on cutting expenses, or I'm sorry, anything under the benchmark is a good thing. Uh, the lower the number, the better, right? That means lower expenses related to your, your income. Uh, so those are just a few of the, the main measurements I wanted to, to touch on when it comes to operation. Um, I think that's all I have here. Any questions here? All right, let's take uh, nine. Well, how much do you guys want? 10, nine? Should we get out of here sooner? Nine minutes? Nine. All right, 10 after. 10 after three. You guys hanging in there? Yeah. All right. We're almost done. We just have to turn the air conditioner off. <laughs> So we'll be back at 310. Hope you can enjoy the weekend. All right, next up. Here are some of the measurements that we look at. And I thought this would be uh, fun to, to share. And by the way, we never put them all three on the same thing, so I know it's a kind of an eyesore. Uh, but I'll explain you know, each one just as more industry you know, effects over the, the last couple of years, et cetera. Um, first off, I mentioned uh, occupancy, right? And that's the one in the middle, the, uh, the longer one, uh, middle right. And this was, this shows uh, the previous year you, uh, would have been 2020. So the orange line is 2020 and the blue line is 2021. So as you can see there from, from February of 2020 on the orange line, right? We were just on right about 96% occupancy. That was about, as I mentioned before, 95, 96 in, in LA um, total occupancy in the multifamily world, in the apartment world. And as you remember, COVID shutdowns happened in March, and then you could kind of see how that affected occupancy uh, moving into the end of 2020 as that orange line trended downward. 
then the blue line would have been the following year. Uh, we put them on top of each other so you could see the, the difference. So that would have been February of 2021 on the blue line where it starts. And then you could see the upward trajectory through summer months and where we kind of got back to quote unquote pre-COVID levels uh, in June of 2021. And as you could see, the occupancy just continued to increase through October and then has maintained that 97 uh, all the way up to 98 uh, occupancy. Um, I thought that was interesting just to illustrate uh, the, the effects of the pandemic. But remember the different lever, levers that you use in operation, right? You can mess with price, something called concessions, movement concessions, kind of a sale. Hey, come over here. You can get you know, one month free type thing. That's what shows at the bottom. This is occupancy, which is the, the uh, I guess the bar graphs in blue at the bottom. Uh, by month, that shows you the occupancy over the same period of two years in a line, of course, and then the moving concessions uh, in the, the orange line. So basically, we're riding pretty cool, and then COVID hits, occupancy starts dropping. So what happens? Know the trend? You got to start discounting some rents. So uh, again, kind of seeing the effects of COVID on prices and what happened. Now, there were plenty of properties throughout LA. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, our, our low on the occupancy uh, was right around 92. I don't think I did mention that actually. Through the pandemic, we dropped to about 92, 91, 92 was the low. There were some properties, uh, Westwood, for example, big, you know, student population. There were uh, building owners there that I know, we didn't operate for them, but in talking to them, they had they were as low as 65, 70% occupied. So that's a 30% plus uh, vacancy factor, right? That is big. Because remember, they're trying to pay their bills too. So they had, uh, and then collections on top of it, right? That was just a, a vacancy factor. But having these, the data, to see what's happening in trends gives you the, the benefit from an asset management standpoint or an operation standpoint, what you have to do to stay ahead, to survive, what's happening in the market, understand what's marketing and make those decisions accordingly. Now you can see at the end, now today, occupancy is so high. When we reach kind of max occupancy here in LA, that's when as a group, we said, okay, shut down the sales, no more sale prices, right? Bring the concessions off the table. And that's what you can see, concessions are on their way down and occupancy uh, remains high. Any questions um, on this? I think the only other thing uh, at the top I did mention, that just shows leads, number of leasing calls versus occupancy, right? So anytime, which is nice for us, um, Anytime we see leads dropping, which we tend to do, seasonality uh, effects, we can make adjustments when leads stop because occupancy is usually a, a, a trailing factor. We can make necessary decisions to try to keep occupancy high, et cetera. All this is, basically what I'm trying to show you, is data-driven decisions, right? You need optics to make good decisions. Question? I was just what? Great question, great question. So remember we're a regional company, so we have the data for LA. LA, as you guys know, we got beautiful weather most of the time. So your seasonality effect in LA is not as great as say somewhere with cold climate that you're dealing with snow. But with that said, there's still some seasonality when it comes to leases and the number of leases, actually you probably see it here. So the summertime is the highest. Um, lowest typically, I know again, pandemic kind of throws, throws some things, uh, throw some data right through in the washing machine to tumbles it a little bit. But the fact is typically January is the uh, slowest. Gradually going up to summer months and then dropping back down into the holiday season with January being the lowest um, to answer that question. The question was seasonality effect uh, on leasing in Los Angeles. Any other questions? That was a great question. Yes. 
Yeah, I think, you know, depending on families, right? You got school year to consider for, for kids. You've got holidays, um, choice of moving. You also have the ability as an operator knowing that um, there's more movement in summer months when, when people are moving. We can expire lease terms in the summer months. So we're not, we don't have an exodus or many people moving out in December or January where it's harder to fill those units. But that's just another element or tool that we could use um, to protect ourselves on the, from a vacancy uh, side. Uh, any other questions? Nothing in chat? All right, I see that. Here's some technology. By the way, we're, we're almost done. I want to wrap up uh, to give us a you know, good amount of time on any question and answers. And for those of you that want to run out and enjoy the weekend, you're free to. And I know there was, uh, you know, if there's any request to stand or to stay after and talk to me, I'm, I'm here for you. So whatever you need me to do is fine. So I already mentioned uh, a few times how technology plays an important role in processes of an operation, et cetera. Uh, in the pandemic, you, you know, it's interesting. It's like when you, you run into some issues, anytime, you know, you're faced with problems, industry responds with a pivot, right? And, and what we've seen um, even before the pandemic, as I mentioned, with all the uh, money pouring into real estate investments, uh, with the pandemic, we, we had our own set of issues, right? One of those was, you know, leasing offices have to be closed to the public. So there uh, was born another company, plenty of them do it now, but they're self-tour, right? Self-tour. So uh, you could set up through an app or online and you could go tour a unit by yourself, right? We had to do that during the pandemic and it became pretty popular. Um, paper, I mean, even restaurants now, right? It's like so many of them don't take cash. And if you, if you pull out cash, they look at you uh, cross-eyed, right? They're going, what the heck is that? Because everything is, is hands-free now. So when you think of like Apple Pay or what have you, um, very similar in the apartment world. Uh, we use a company called Demuso. Uh, Demuso is just that, a hands-free payment processing deal. They're specialized in apartments. Um, any guarantee funds, they do it with their technology. They have that ability to do it. Uh, and everything is done online. Um, security and surveillance. So one of the issues with increased crime in, in LA you have security issues, right? If you're gonna have any raving fan residents if you've got break-ins uh, in the garage all the time. So smaller buildings, 10, 20, 30, 40, even, you know, even 60, 70 units. Security guards are expensive, right? To be there through the night or 24 seven, whatever it is. So even the security industry has, has implemented technology where they have cameras and surveillance and it's all AI driven so they know if somebody is standing in an area too long, right? It's, uh, it triggers the computer to, to set an alarm or a voice will come over and say, please move on, you know, type thing. Some of them are live surveillance, some of them are AI. AI is becoming, um, is, is really becoming the norm, will be the norm in many industries and, and certainly the apartment industry. You know, we talked about the issue of uh, missed calls for leasing calls. Uh, they have technology out there where, um, AI will take the calls, answer your questions, et cetera. Uh, it's certainly not perfected yet, but I think we'll all be interacting with, with more computers, uh, whether we, we like it or not. Uh, see if there's anything else we're talking about from tech. I think the main point is, you know, you want to create efficiencies and you want to utilize technology uh, as a good operator to increase those efficiencies. We do have some questions at the end. As you guys know, there's a, a QR code uh, that we'll get to shortly. Um, and we will do a q and A. I want to show one more video because uh, I think it's important whether you, um, whether you go work somewhere, you start your own company, et cetera, culture is obviously a big play, right? It's a, the, the operating world, the apartment operating is a people business. The asset management or operation in real estate bottom line is a people business. So culture becomes so important and not only an organization, but in the vendors that we partner with, et cetera. And here is a video that, that we did as well uh, that kind of highlights our culture, uh, highlighting some of our employees at Moss.
I think the culture here is made out of respect, team building, caring and development, really caring about who the team members are that coming on. Yo siempre Moss va a ser mi segunda familia. This company has been so good to me on so many different levels that I want to do a good job for them. Siempre, todo el tiempo Moss, porque pues yo aquí crecí con ellos y yo aquí me voy a retirar. Their support and their role in my life has been has been tremendous. I've grown so much in, in ways that like I never thought I would. It's definitely helped me out in a sense of being in the world. <laughs> There's the compassion and the empathy that our culture is, is built out of. Pues uno se siente bien que ellos lo, lo traten a uno así, o sea, que, que lo vean como familia. Bond with people, understand and see what their skill set is, focus on what their skills are and make them the best that they are at that. Everybody has the capability to learn something new as well. You just have to sometimes take a little bit more time and patience with them. Moss pushes education. They want you to get better at your job. An associate, a bachelor, is an MBA, buying my first house. I started off at, at 23 here with absolutely none of those things. They go out of their way to make sure that everyone is cared for. You're talking to your family and you're excited. It's like the same kind of feeling. They always let us know that it's personal because they care to hear what we have to say. We'll listen to you, hear you out, try to give you advice or sometimes just try to get advice out of you for you to figure it out yourself. Everyone reaching and pitching in to help each other definitely is something that's built into the company that's just in the culture. Everything that we've put in for so many years of developing that culture is shared. I want to be that person that one day can make a difference and help out someone. You have to have compassion and empathy, but you also have to have strength and flexibility. It's a diverse place to work. Like a melting pot, which is how it should be. The soul of it, it's um, the family. And they see us like a family, you know. Everybody respects and loves one another. This is my family, it's not just work. I get really touched with everybody because, you know, we came so close. It's so exciting to see something like this grow so, so quickly and to be a part of it, that's an honor. So that's really my why, right? The, the company why. Uh, I get touched every time I, I see that. Uh, and I think, you know, hopefully today as we wrap up with questions and such, my hope is, you know, back to the contribution and growth. I wish you guys and everyone on Zoom um, just that, growth and progress. Um, remember to keep rewriting your story. You know, Don Miller talks about working with uh, Olympic athletes on top of the world. They win a gold medal and then they come home and they're depressed because it's never about getting it. It's about the process. And what you can learn in those books, I wish I learned at a younger age, right out of school. That would have been awesome. So grab those books, keep rewriting your story. When you make that goal that you wrote down, that first one, rewrite it. Keep rewriting the story. Are you the, the hero, the guy? It's your story. You're the director, you're the writer. Don't let that pass. I'm telling you what you learned today, if you put into action, you guys will be flying in your private jets and making a difference in the world. And it'll be your money, so you get to do whatever the hell you want with it. No one can tell you else otherwise. So I do wish you the best. Um, thank you for, uh, again, allowing me the opportunity to come speak to you guys. And I, I look forward to uh, hopefully, hopefully you keep everything you wrote down, put it somewhere safe and, and revisit it and keep writing it down. Um, as you take action, execution, like we talked about earlier, you got to take action. You got to execute. If you do nothing else, take action, right? For those things you wrote down, your goals, uh, your, your outcomes, and then the why, that will continue to evolve. This was a, a, the first time doing it. Keep at it. And then as you circle those that you're going to say is my one-year goal or my five-year goal 
or my 10 year goal, when you write that out, you circle them, you need to write down what your action plan is, right? Tony Robbins talks about taking massive action and that's how you learn. Too many people take the knowledge, know it better than anyone, but they never take the massive action necessary. So hopefully today and through the rest of the certificate program, you will push yourself into action and learn. You will fail, but that means you're learning. So that's a good thing. So thank you guys again. You know what to do with the QR code. There's a couple of questions. Oh, you guys don't see it. Or do you? There are other questions. Uh, Hugo, I did it right, I think. Um, answer those questions. And I will be here as you, uh, I guess they answer them now, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. And I'll be here for Q and A and uh, it, I'll be here till whenever you guys uh, are done with me. So if anyone wants to stay after and have a conversation, I'm happy uh, to stay. And for those of you on Zoom, did everyone get this? Questions, QRs, we're good? Then on Zoom, oh, here's my uh, info. And I can make these slides available um, as necessary, but there's my cell phone, my email address. So now you have no excuse. Utilize it, just don't put it online. <laughs> I'd have a lot of resident calls. <laughs> <laughs> so do your questions and then uh, when you guys are ready and put, in, put some questions in the chat. Let me know that you're not uh, sleeping. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. heard my name. <laughs> the best part, you get out of the word. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, when you guys are, are done answering, uh, throw out any questions you have or type them in the chat. Sorry about the dentist guys for anybody got those crazy emails. It's been a uh, week long adventure. Long to be a lot of you guys. So. so I will, while you guys are typing, if you don't mind, I will answer the one question on uh, deals. Uh, the question was any examples of what essentially home runs yeah. or deals in general? Or just the average. Average, okay. Well, you know, let's start with the big one. This was a, uh, a client of ours uh, back in, it's actually kind of a cool story. Uh, back in 2007, they bought in Reno, Nevada. Now, remember what was happening in 07, 08? The housing boom, right? or the bus, they bought 750 units, which we operated and we were regional, but we went out to Reno for this client. And there's five, two buildings, 500 units and 250 units. Because of the, the housing and, and rents going down, et cetera, during that, uh, that uh, you know, what do they call it, the financial bust, uh, the owners went to the bank to ask for, you know, to, to negotiate with them, right? Because these things are non-recourse, which means he wasn't on the hook personally. He could walk away from it. So before you walk away, you go and talk to the lender and say, hey, this isn't working out. I'm going to walk away. Two different lenders, the 250 unit lender said, then get away. They left, they left the lender with the 250. The 500 units, the lender negotiated, they kept it. That was 07. They bought the building for 17 million. The 500 units. Now, anyone know what happened 
to Reno in the last five years. Tesla goes over, right? COVID hits. So everything from San Fran, right? Just pouring into the, the Valley, Tahoe, Reno area. They turned down an offer to buy that, to sell that thing. 80 million. So 17 to 80, that's a pretty big home run. And of course, yes, I do make fun of them for getting rid of that 250 units. Because that would have been, that made someone a lot of money too, right? So that's a home run. That's hard to find. I mean, that's some big time money. Um, let me give you the bad side, right? Oftentimes you just hear the good side. I learned a lesson. My first uh, investment with a client who will remain nameless because they're big in LA uh, was a retail a value add redevelopment of retail on Sunset Boulevard. It was 2017. You figured it was about a, it was more of a loan type thing where my upside was capped, but then they would make everything over. It was supposed to be, uh, I believe, a year a year or two max, um, delays on construction, potential mismanagement, this bleeds into uh, 2020, COVID hits, 100% of my investment gone. I know, brutal, it, it, apparently it happens. Uh, that's rare, but so you gotta be careful. And I learned my lesson the hard way. Uh, and it's a, a great, someone with a great experience. They just mismanaged it, unfortunately. Just go back to the dark where we got people. Oh, my bad. Sorry about that. I don't want to interrupt. All good. Yeah. So there's a good deal and a bad deal. And then, um, you know, remember that my that first deal I told you about, um, the 10 units in Hollywood? It was how I got into my first deal was a question online. It was 1.1 1 .1, uh, over by Sony, uh, no, Paramount Studios. Um, that was an eight unit, small 1930s type uh, units. Uh, bought it for one one. And the reason, by the way, talk about massive action and needing a push. Another great story. I'm on the golf course with a broker. A guy by the name of Steve Geiger with Lee and Associates. He's an old timer and he was just trying to be a guy. He said, Chris, and we were on a tee box at Moore Park Country Club. He said, Chris, I'll bet you $100. And it was a a, a tournament we sponsor for them. So we're, we're at the same tournament every year. This time next year on this tee box, I'll bet you a hundred bucks you don't own a building. So what do I do? I'll bet him. It, and he he pushed me to take action on that one one. And that next year, uh, we were sitting on that box, he gave me a hundred bucks. Of course, I bought the deal from him, so he made a lot more. But <laughs> he's a pretty smart guy. But um, but that thing it was, is probably worth now, you know, on the market about one one. So you kind of a double of a value or two one. Uh, so, you know, time with a good operation, passive income, it's fantastic. So that's that question. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Was there anything on chat? They just want out. Huh? Oh, thank you. Question. Uh, I guess uh, you know, when you're trying to find. Good question. Uh, and, and by the way, operation is a great way to get into uh, real estate, right? So if you put together a deal, you could get paid to operate, right? You end up taking the management fee. So the question is, how does a management company go out and get new business? Um, for the longest time for us, it was all referral. So we have our signs on pretty much all the buildings that we operate. So if you have a good footprint in an area and someone wants a manager, they see kind of who's in the area and signage. So we'll get a lot of that organically from signage. Uh, it wasn't in referrals, right? So that the real estate world is small. It's a small world out there. The, the bigger owners, they know each other. And, um, you know, that's a network that you want to be uh, potentially a part of, obviously, right, from referrals. So all of our business was signage, organic, um, and referrals from other clients. It wasn't until just a year ago uh, we hired somebody on the new business uh, development side. Because remember, when I first joined, that was kind of my job. Uh, so we did hire someone, and it's and it's going really well. We, we've added uh, almost a, about 800 units in uh, this year already. 
So, you know, by the way, I think a lot of the restrictions of LA and, uh, you know, um, some of this stuff with, with COVID, you know, there's a lot of uh, obstacles out there locally. And so I think that's also pushed a lot of, uh, I'll say mom and pop owners or owner operators that they're done with it and they want just someone else to handle it. Um, so I hate to say thank you for the, to the city of LA for all their restrictions, but I'm sure that's a fact, uh, a factor of, of our growth recently. Any other questions? Any questions on rent control too? Just to uh, think about that for a second. Go ahead. Um, I know you know this briefly, but what's your opinion on short term rent control? Do you recommend getting into that or would you say more focus on long term rentals? Uh, from an investment standpoint, yeah, investment standpoint. Um, I love Airbnb from an investment standpoint. The big risk is going, finding a place, a city, right? Local jurisdiction where they're not going to shut you down. Uh, so there are many cities that, that, you know, stopped it. There are HOAs that you need to make sure before getting in. Um, quick story on, on that. A friend did Airbnb in Arizona. It was going really well. And the HOA around a neighbor shut him down. So he had to sell it. So he was in and out. Fortunately, he didn't get hurt. But then he, now he's in another neighborhood doing the same thing with a few more. But Airbnb... If you, as long as you kind of figure out the, the, the political side of things, and you know, you, it's hard to tell the future, but if, if there's a, a local city that they don't mind and you're in a neighborhood that you don't mind, it's a, a great way to invest. Um, probably the best returns uh, in real estate uh, right now, actually. Good question. Any other questions? Not all cities are uh, under rent control. California, right? There's some, some limitations there in the state, big time in, in certain cities. It seems like that's the new thing. The local cities are coming up with their own restrictions and ordinances on rent control. And that's obviously a, a very important element to keep an eye on as you invest or you operate, because uh, it might hinder your ability to increase rents as we were talking about as an operator. But as a renter, find the rent control. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which cities uh, made well, LA County, for sure. Do they have their own? And then all the incorporated cities within LA Culver City, LA, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Pasadena. Is one. Um, so, most to your question, I think the most. Restrictive now, oddly enough, is LA, city of LA. Santa Monica used to be really hardcore. Well, you know why? Sheila Kuehl moved from Santa Monica to LA. <laughs> she's, a, she's a supervisor, creating havoc. Everything she did in Santa Monica, now she's doing it. But she's retired, so that's good news. Good news for apartment owners. Good questions. Anything else? Rock and roll. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>